Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about math or mathematics in CAD. Okay, because basically when you do sketches, when you create sketches in any CAD software, let's say here Katia, it has lots of fancy tools which can give you all sorts of 2D shapes. And for me teaching this course uh, so many times, Whenever I ask one of my students, what do you think is happening behind the scene, right? So, for example, you all know if I give you, you want to draw a circle, you click on a point, that means an X and a Y. Then you move and you click on another point, that is another X and a Y, and the distance between these two is the radius. So, you have determined the uh, center, and by clicking on the second point, you have fixed the radius. And circle is the locus of all points in the 2D plane where the distance of them from a, const, a fixed point called the center is a fixed distance, fixed number, which called the radius. So that means circle is determined. Done. All you need for a circle is center point and radius, and you got it using these two points. Fine. That's not a big deal. But sometimes it's not as trivial like here. You click on three points. You don't determine the center, you don't determine the radius. You just click on three points and then it will pass a circle through them. So you say here, here, and then here. And it passes. And I always ask my students, how do you think it is done? And please don't me that it is done by magic because I really hate that word in engineering. Okay? In engineering, we either know how something is done or we don't. Okay, trying to say uh, irrelevant words like, I don't know, this is just magic or something. No, you better know how everything is done behind the scene. Don't look at these commands as a black box. And why is that? Well, many of you, as far as uh, I know, might not directly go into the CAD business, but some of you do. And some of you even uh, are going to work for uh, big cat companies like the Salt Systems, right? That is making Katia and SolidWorks for Fusion, for so many other uh, companies, Autodesk, right? And so on, AutoCAD. So the thing is, okay, when they write these commands, they create new commands, they modify the old ones, they try to make them faster, better, they add and more and more commands. Uh, everything is done mathematically behind the scene. Equations are solved, problems are formulated and solved mathematically. And that's how every one of these commands is working, okay? Or like you try three lines, right? You select three lines, correct? Let's say here. Here, I do one, I do two, and then I do three lines, and then... I go here and I say try tangent. So I just select the three lines and it draws a circle tangent to all three, like that. Well, how is it done? Because nowhere I have defined the center nor the uh, radius. Okay? Or SP line. You just click on a bunch of points. Let's say you want to draw an airfoil. Just click on a bunch of points and then it passes this smooth night curve through them. Well, what kind of curve is it? How is the equation of this curve determined? Most of my students have no idea. Even sometimes we go as simple as an ellipse. We want to draw an ellipse, right? When you draw an ellipse, you click on a point that is the center, then you move, and this point is going to be the end of semi-major radius. And then here, you don't have to click at the end of the semi-minor. You just click on one point on the circumference. So first center, then semi-major, then one point on the ellipse. Using these three clicks, how would you fix the ellipse, right? Or let's say here, you draw two curves, and by using Katia, it draws a bitangent for you, or you have a curve, it draws a normal. So let's say here, I want to draw a normal on this curve at that point, okay? And you see, here we go. That line is normal to that circle at that point, or as I said, this um, tritangent, uh, bitangent line, right? So let's say you have these two circles, like they are representing two pulleys right? And now you want to draw the belt. 
So what you go, you go here and say I want the um, by tangent line, you click on the top point on this one and you click on the top point on this one and boom, you get the line tangent to both and you can repeat that at the bottom points here, right? Like this and this and you can get that. And now you can go and let's say you can go and trim here uh, some portion of this one, let's say here and here. And now you get yourself uh, something similar to what? To two of the pulleys with the belt. So this is the belt, right? If you want to calculate the length of the belt that needs to go around the two pulleys, if you know the center line, then this is how you draw it. And then you can go ahead and do measurement and measure it. Okay, so how is it done? Any of these things, how are they done mathematically? And that's the topic I want to discuss here. So that we don't take cat commands as magic and black box. We know what is going on behind the scene. Like one of the questions I recently asked my students in the class, one of the simplest one is, you have a uh, circle and you have a point outside the circle. And my task is this, go ahead and draw me a line tangent to this circle from this point. Okay. That's one of the tasks you can easily do in a CAD software. How would you do that? Because all you do really, you have the circle and you have the point. So how does it find the location of the tangent point so that it can connect your outside point to the tangent point, okay? So if I call this tangent point whatever you want, maybe I can call it, let's say, uh, T. Right, so I call that point T. The question is, how does it find the coordinate of T? I give you P, I give you C, and I give you the radius R. You give me the location of T. How would you do that? Okay, so uh, you can look at it geometrically or mathematically. So let's say here, I go ahead and uh, set the origin for the sake of simplicity you don't have to but let's say i go ahead and uh, put the um, origin at the center of the circle you don't have to but again it makes the derivation a little bit simpler but in general it's not going to affect anything okay so here let's say you centered it at origin you fix the uh, distance r the radius this is your point P, which has some coordinates X of P and Y of P, and you want to find T, okay? So let's say the coordinate of this T is X and Y, and you don't know that, and the coordinate of this P is X of P and Y of P, or let's say X naught and Y naught, which is known, R is known, the center of circle is at origin, and my goal is to find x and y. Well, how, how do I do that? Well, mathematically, if you want to do it, you know that if you connect your um, outside point to the tangent point, then let's see if I can get it closer. Yes, there we go. That guy is definitely perpendicular to what? It is perpendicular to the radius line, which is coming from the um, center to the tangent line, right? You know, the tangent line is perpendicular to the radius line. So now, can that give you any help? Yes. So mathematically speaking, the slope of this line PT is perpendicular to CT, correct? So I can say line CT is perpendicular to line PT. And you know mathematically two lines are perpendicular when the product of the slopes is negative 1. So what is the slope of line CT? Clearly you go from 0, 0 to Y and X, so the slope is Y over X. And what's the slope of this line? Going from S naught, Y naught to X and Y, you know the slope is delta Y over delta X, so it's Y minus Y naught over X minus X naught. The product of these two slopes have to be negative 1, so that gives you one equation between X and Y. If you cross multiply it, right, you will get Y squared minus Y naught Y is equal to negative X squared, 
and then plus x x naught. Okay, so that's one relation between x and y. You can call it equation one. And then the other thing you have is point T is on the circle, which means x squared plus y squared has to be what? R squared. And that is your equation number two. And so all you have to do is to solve one and two at the same time. Once you do that, then it is two equations, two unknowns. It's not going to be hard to solve, although it's a little bit nonlinear, but it should not provide so much of difficulty for this uh, computer to find the solution of a two by two, even though if it, it is nonlinear. Okay, so it's not really such a major deal. And uh, that's mathematically. The other way that uh, you probably have seen it around is geometrically. If I just, I'm teaching you like technical drawing and say, hey, could you draw me uh, the tangent line with just basic tools like a, uh, let's say, protractor, compass, and so on, ruler, and without anything else, then uh, yes, you still can do it. What you need to do in that case is, um, let's see if I can get this out of the way. There we go. So what you need in that case is you have to connect your outside point to the center like this. Then what you need is to draw the perpendicular bisector of this line PC or just determine the center for now. So the center is point H. Okay, so the center is point H. Everybody, I guess, knows how to draw the perpendicular bisector. So you use the compass, open it with a value of or a length of more than half of CP. And then you get uh, two arcs, one from P, one from C, like this. And then one at the bottom, like that. And then once you connect these guys together, you get the center H. But now that you got H, how do you determine T? So what you need is here, you open the um, uh, compass. But before that, let me tell you something important. Remember, I told you that this triangle, if you remember, this triangle that you form, it is a right triangle, right? And there is one important thing in geometry if you know in a right triangle in a right triangle like this if you connect the 90 degree corner point to the middle of the hypotenuse so this is the middle point the length of this median is also the same as the what the two halves of the hypotenuse so the length of this median line is half of the hypotenuse. So all three of these guys are the same length. Okay, and it's easily provable. So what you're trying to do is exactly that, that the distance of this point H that I have now to the center is the same as the distance it has to what? The tangent point T. So now you put the needle of your compass here, open it as much as CH, and then what? Just draw one arc centered at H and with a radius of CH. And if you do that, it is going to be something like this. And that arc is intersecting your circle at this point. So that is going to be your contact point T. And if you draw a line from T to P, that's your um, tangent line. Okay, so that's geometrically with the proof of that, and that's mathematically if you want to formulate it. But this is how this single line from this, out, this point outside the circle is drawn tangent to it. Okay, there is math background. It's not like, yeah, it's just doing it by magic. No. Let's say the other example I told you. You have three points, and you draw a circle. You just click on the three points, and uh, Katia or SolidWorks, is going to draw a circle through them. How does it do that? 
Well, let me see if I can get a circle that big that can fit these. Okay, it has to be a little bit smaller. This is not bad. So let's say this is what I get. Okay. And now how, how do I do that? Well, you know, for a circle to draw, to be drawn, you need the center and you need the radius. Now, how do I do it? Well, geometrically, if you draw two of the three chords by these endpoints, so let's say I draw this chord, and then I also draw this chord. Even if you draw this chord, doesn't matter, right? Chord is any line that connects two points on a circle together. You can show that, so this line is not necessarily what? The diagonal line. And uh, to disambiguate that, let me see if I can get this point off now. So I put it somewhere else so that it doesn't look like it is a uh, diagonal. Okay. So it's something like this. So the geometry theorem says that if you draw the perpendicular bisector to each one of these chords, so the first one is going to be something like this, right? So these two are equal, that is 90 degrees. The second one is probably going to be something like this. Again, these two are equal, that angle is 90 degrees. And the third one is probably something like that. Also means these two are equal and that is 90 degrees. It says if you draw these properly, they would intersect all, not just these, all of them, all of these perpendicular bisectors would intersect at the center. So what I clicked on were points x1 and y1, point x2 and y2, and point x3 and y3. And not only it found for me O, it also found for me what? The radius, which is this distance. Okay, and mathematically speaking again, so geometrically speaking, you saw how it's done. Just draw the chords. Two of them is enough. You don't even need the third one. Two of them are enough and draw the perpendicular bisector of the two wherever they hit. That's your um, uh, center. Okay, so I really do not need a third one. And so to simplify that, let me get rid of this portion. So now how do I do it mathematically? Because computer cannot draw a compass and do that, right? They have to formulate it using algebra and geometry. So they need this center point, let me call it uh, like M1, and this center point, let me call it M2. So if I know x1, y1, x3, and y3, you know m1 is not hard to find. It's just the average of the two x's and the average of the two y's. The same thing here, m2 is the average of x1, x2, and x of it, and y of it is the average of y1 and y2. So this point is like x1 plus x2 divided by 2 and y1 plus y2 divided by 2. And similarly for this one x1 plus x3 divided by 2, and uh, y1 plus y3 divided by 2. Okay, so that's not really a hard thing. Everybody knows that. So I know these guys because I know the points. Now I draw a line normal to the line passing through x1, y1, x3, y3. So I need to know the equation of this line, and then I need to know equation of this line. And when I intersect them, each one, you know, their slope are negative reciprocal of the slope of this, which I know. The slope of this one is negative reciprocal of this one slope, which I know. So I know the slopes. I know the 
one point. So the equations of these two lines are perfectly known. When you intersect them, there are two unknowns, an x and a y, and those x and y will be x of the center and y of the center, right? So if I write the equation of this line as, let's say, y is equal to um, a1 plus b1 times x, and this one is y equal like c1 plus d1 times x, where b1 and d1 are the slopes and a1, c1 are y-intercepts, then from the intersection of these two, I can clearly get what? I can clearly get x of o and y of o. Right? Two equations, linear and two unknowns. It's not hard to do. And as I said, you know, the slope of b1 and d1 are uh, negative reciprocal of that. For example, b1 which is the slope of that, is negative 1 over the slope of this line. And the slope of this line is delta y over delta x. Okay, so that will give me b1, or let's say d1 is something similar. It's negative 1 over uh, y3 minus y1 divided by x3 minus x1. Okay, so you can write it as x1 minus x3 divided by y3 minus y1. And this is like x1 minus x2 divided by y2 minus y1. So knowing those values, calculating b1 and d1 is no problem. a and c also are the intercepts which we easily can determine, right? In general, when you write the equation of a line like this, so uh, this is going to be like y minus y of m2 is equal to the slope, which you called um, y, y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1, this whole thing times x minus x of m2, correct? This is the equation of this line that connecting x1, y1 to x2, y2. And you clearly see that the slope is this much. This is your slope. And your y-intercept is so this whole thing times x. And then the y-intercept is going to be y of m2. And then minus the slope times x of m2. Right? So that's all it is. But as I said, the equation, if I want the equation of this line, the perpendicular, the only thing is the slope has to be what? Has to be negative reciprocal of that. So instead of this, what I have to plug in is negative reciprocal of that. So instead of these, what I have to do is, as I showed on the top for you, it has to be x1 minus x2 over y2 minus y1. And this is again x1 minus x2, y2 minus y1. So this is the equation of this line here. This is this equation. This guy is a1, and this guy here is b1. Or, sorry, this one is b1, the other one is a1. b1 is the slope. And you can write a similar thing for the other perpendicular bisector. Cut them, and the intersection is the center. Once you have the center, the distance from the center to one of the points is your radius, and that means now the circle is perfectly determined okay so these are important let's look at other things circle tangent to three lines remember i had a uh, i had three lines and then i asked katia to draw a circle tangent to all three how does it do it so let's see if i can get something even roughly good OK, 
Okay, here for the sake of fastness of the presentation, I change the problem a little bit. I move my tangent point if I can. Let's see if I can. The thing is you have limitations here in OneNote for moving stuff. Okay, let's assume that's a circle. <laughs> it's not perfect, but that's good enough. So I have the three lines. So for each line, I exactly know their equation, right? This is like uh, y equal a1 x plus b1. This is like y equal c1 x plus d1. And this is like y equals uh, e1 x plus f1. So all of these six numbers are known. What I need is the center and the radius of the circle. So the thing is, the tangent points here, this point, this point, and this point, I don't know their coordinates. So this point, I can call it, for example, point x1. Let's say I don't know the x of it. But y of it is given through the equation of the line. So it is a1x1 plus b1. This point, I can call it x2. I don't know the x of it. And y of it is c1x2 plus d1. And this point, I can call it x3. And then e1x3 plus f1. So all unknowns I have right now are x1, x2, and x3. Once I know the x's, the y's are given by the equation of the lines. So three unknowns. And how do I get three equations to get these three unknowns? Well, that's not a big problem. Just because you know, if I draw a perpendicular to this line at this point, and if I draw a perpendicular to the other line and this line, it should ideally, if everything is right, they should ideally all come and intersect at the center. Correct? So, and I assume at this point you know how to draw, how to get the equation of these lines, right? As I just told you in the previous slide, like what is the equation of this line? Well, the slope of it is negative 1 over the slope of this line, and it is passing through that point. So the equation of it is y minus a1x1 plus b1 is equal to the slope of it, which is negative 1 over a1 times x minus x1. So that's the equation of this line. You get a similar line for this, and you get a similar equation of line for this one. Correct? Let me just uh, do it fast here. Mm. And then this one. You have three equations, and there are three unknowns, x1, x2, and x3. You know at the intersection point, x and y for all three lines should be the same. So what you do is, in these three equations, you set all x's to be the same, you say all the y's to be the same, as I did here, and that means three equations with three unknowns, x1, x2, and x3, once you have them, uh, you know the location of the tangent points, and once you put the x1, or x2, or x3 in any of these equations, or two of the equations, those will give you the x and the y of the center. Okay, so if you call this point, point O, you can say these are all y and x of what? Point O. Okay, and that should be enough to... Uh, give you the coordinates now uh, maybe not necessarily the reason is uh, y not is unknown x x of not is unknown x 1 2 and 3 are unknown so actually 
these guys, there are uh, five unknowns in three equations. So what you need is uh, at least two more equations. And guess what? Those equations come from the distances of these uh, tangent points to the center that is equal to each other. So, for example, the distance of this point to center is the same as the distance of this point to the center. So you will get y of O minus y of this point. squared plus x of o minus x of this point squared that is r squared that is the same as a similar thing if you just do it for what for point number two which is going to be y naught minus uh, c1 x2 plus d1 squared and then plus x minus x2 squared so this is one equation that says the radius is both this and this and they are equal and then next time you do say this radius and now this radius they are the same thing right so what you need to do for the next one is basically copy this Come down here, paste it. There we go. And then just change some of the things, which is uh, like this. And so that is going to be x3, and this is going to be x3, this is going to be e1, this is going to be f1. So now, as you can see, you have five equations and five unknowns. And that is enough to give you the uh, center, the tangent points, and of course, once you plug it back in one of these top equations, that's the radius. Okay, so you see, mathematically going behind the scene is not as trivial as you think it is when you are doing the sketches. Line normal to curve at a point, that's not the hardest thing. If you know the equation of this point, y equal f of x, and uh, you know the coordinate of this point, x naught and y naught, this is basic calculus. You know, if you have the tangent line here, normal line is going to be perpendicular to that. So what you need is the equation of the tangent line. Not really, actually, all you need is the slope of the tangent line. And you know the slope of the tangent line is f prime of x at x naught. So the equation of this line is actually what? y minus uh, y naught is equal to slope of perpendicular, which is negative 1 over slope of the tangent times x minus x naught. So once I know the equation for my curve and my um, location of the point, drawing the normal is no big deal. Just a simple reminder of calculus. The other thing was the ellipse. If you remember in the ellipse, what we did was we clicked at the center, so we fixed x naught and y naught. We clicked at the end of the um, semi major, so we determined value of a, but we did not click at the end of the semi minor. We instead clicked on some point like here. Okay, so let me call this x of p and y of p. So instead, we click on point P, which is one arbitrary point on the circumference of the ellipse, and we did not really determine value of B. We gave A, we gave X naught, and Y naught. And yet, it gave me the equation of the ellipse, or could draw the ellipse for me. You know the equation of an ellipse like this is x minus x naught divided by a squared and this is an ellipse that is not rotated if it's rotated then you have to bring in one extra parameter theta but 
for the moment, let's just make life easy and say it's not just tilted. It's just perfectly uh, aligning its major and minor axes with X and Y. So Y minus Y naught over B squared, this whole thing is equal to 1. So you determine X naught, Y naught, and A. So you don't need, uh, you, you didn't provide B. If you have B, it means the equation is completely known. So you can just plug a bunch of X and Y's in it, get some numbers, and then connect them together. But the matter of fact is, how do you determine B? So that's where the definition of the ellipse comes into play. What is an ellipse? If you remember, when you clicked in uh, Katia, let me show you one more time. When you do an ellipse, it is showing you something extra if you pay attention. So look here. If you look right now, you see that from this point, two lines are drawn to two points for me on the major axis, right? One point on the right, one point on the left, which as you know, we call them the focal point. And uh, of course, if I move my point up and down, it means that I'm also moving my focal point. Okay, but something seems constant and that is the sum of the distance from this point on the circumference to those two focal points, that is not changing. And that is actually the exact definition of the ellipse. For ellipse, as you know, the definition is this. That... If you know these two focal points, sum of the distance from the ellipse, any point on the ellipse, sum of the distance from any point on the ellipse to these two focal points is always constant. So if this distance we call it d1 and this distance we call it d2, Then the definition of ellipse is this, that d1 plus d2 is a constant. Again, we call these two points f2 and f1, focal point 1 and focal point 2. Now, the sum of the distance is constant, but how much is the constant? Well, all you need is to put your test point on, let's say, this point here. If you put it here, now this is going to be your D2 and this is going to be your D1. And you know the ellipse is symmetric, so this portion of it, this D2, is the same as this portion here. So if you add them together, you clearly see some of that distance, that constant is equal to 2 times A, or the major diameter. Okay, so this distance constant is 2 times A, the length of the major diameter. So that's the definition of an ellipse. Good. Now the question for you is, uh, how do you determine value of B? Because once you know B, it's all done. So here I clicked on point uh, P, correct? So for point P, I can write it as XP minus X naught, YP minus Y naught squared over A squared, B squared equal 1. Now, know that here I have fixed point P, I know X naught, I know Y P, I know Y naught, I know A. Correct? So that means it easily gives me what? It can easily give me B, because that's all it is, right? I know my center, I know my click point, I know A, and from here I can find B. But where are those focal points also? Do I know the location of the focal points? Yes, it is not really hard to show the location of the focal points if you need them. That the location of the focal points, if I call this distance, uh, let me call both of these uh, focal distances F. Uh, it's not going to be easy. Let me see what I can do. Clean things up a little bit. 
Okay, so if I call this distance from here to here F, and also this distance from here to here F, the length of the focal length basically, how is F related to A and B here? Well, it's just again not hard to show that F, the focal length, is related to A and B by F is equal to square root of A squared minus B squared. I leave this part for you if you want to take a look at it or look it up online. But once you know F, once you determine B, you have A, then you can easily find F, and then F is A. Uh, the focal points are F units uh, on the major diagonal to the right side or to the left side of the center, or if the major diameter is upward, then above or below it. If it's tilted, then you have to, as I said, bring the angle theta. Okay, but in general, that's what you do to draw an ellipse, and it's quite surprised me that most of the classes, when I go and ask my students about the equation of an ellipse, they don't know it. Okay, which uh, I really do not like it because I believe that uh, my students have to know the geometry a little bit better. Okay, one other thing we have is by tangent line. So let's say I gave you these two circles, for example. It doesn't need to always be a circle, it's just two arcs in general. But let's say I have these two circles, and uh, now I'm asking you to draw a uh, line tangent to both. And here I'll try to see if I can make life simpler for the sake of demo by centering them both on the x-axis. Okay, that makes life a little bit easier for the sake of derivation. In general, that's not the case. You have to consider completely arbitrary case. But let's say for the moment being, uh, these are the uh, centers are on the x-axis, almost. Something like that. Okay, so the coordinate of the center of first one is 0, 0. The coordinate of the center of the next one is d units away and again y of 0. And now I have clicked on the top of these two circles and then it gives me a, a bitangent line like this. And the question is... Um, how does it determine this ten by tangent line? In other words, how does it determine this location of these two tangent points? If you can determine that, life is going to be easy. Okay, so here... I'm interested in finding the locations of point T1 and T2. And I know R1, I know D, I know R2. How do I find the location of T1 and T2 to draw the bitangent line? Well, uh, if I give them some name to the coordinates X1 and Y1, and then this guy X2 and Y2, First of all, these two points are, there are four unknowns in here. First of all, each point is on its own circle. So here I can say that x1 squared plus y1 squared is equal to r squared. That's for the point t1. For point t2, it's going to be x2 minus d, the location of the center squared, plus y2 minus 0 squared is equal to r2 squared. Okay, so these are the equations directly from the fact that the points are on their own circles. That's two equations, but I need two more 
and the two more are coming from the fact that the slope of these radial lines are perpendicular to the slope of the line connecting T1 to T2. Slope of the line connecting T1 to T2 is x2, correct? It's uh, y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. This slope times the slope of the first radial line has to be negative 1. The slope of that line is clearly y1 over x1. And then also the product of this thing times the slope of the second radial line has to also be negative 1. And the slope of this line, it goes from point D and 0, which is this guy here. To that point, so it is going to be y2 minus 0 over x2 minus d. And d is known, and clearly you have four equations and four unknowns. And in general, when you solve it, it gives you two solutions for x1, y1, and x2, y2. For the same x, it might give you two y values, positive and negative which actually corresponds to the points on the top here and the point on the bottom okay so you also have this point as you saw those equations the first two are quadratic so in general you will for the same x1 and x2 you will get two values of y1 and y2 and which one does Katia give you? If you click on the top points where y was positive, it gives you positive y1, y2. If you click on the bottom, it might give you negative y1 and y2. Finally, SP line, the smooth curve that passes through as many points as you click. And I'm not going to go through tons of detail. I would just like to refer you back mostly to the video I have on this topic specifically. So if you go on my uh, channel, and go under uh, the math playlist you should be able to see one that says cubic sp line and linear interpolations so in here i have explained in a lot more detail that uh, what is going on behind the scene for doing a cubic sp line but just briefly tell you that each one of these guys so between each two points that you click each two subsequent points you are going to get one function. So this is like f1 of x. Okay. And uh, this is like f2 of x. And this is like f3 of x. And each one of these guys is a cubic polynomial. So this is like a plus ex plus cx squared plus dx cubed. This is like e plus fx plus gx squared plus hx cubed. And this is like, let me not use i and j, k plus l times x plus mx squared plus nx cubed. Okay, so in general, um, you have three polynomials and 12 unknowns, correct? You clearly see here I have 12 unknowns. And 12 unknowns means 12 equations. So how would you get 12 equations? I just briefly tell you. So first you have the continuity condition. Continuity means the value of F1 at this point should be the same value of F2 at that point. So continuity gives one equation here and then one equation here. So it means that the value of F2 at that point is the same as F3 at that point. Okay, so two equations coming from continuity
then not only you have continuity at each one of these intermediate points, the slopes have to be the same. So the slope of F1 at this point, whatever it is, uh, should be the same as the slope of F2 at that point. If the slope is not the same, then you have a breaking. You have a sharp corner and you know a curve is not called smooth if it doesn't have derivatives. You call a curve smooth when it has all the orders of derivatives at any point, specifically the first and second derivatives, which are slope and curvature, they have to be the same. Okay, so you get also two equations from slope uh, preservation, or you might call slope continuity. So the value of slope has to be the same. And then you also get two equations from curvature, the second derivative, continuity. So, so far that's six equations. Also, at each point you clicked on the X and Y. So if this point is, for example, X naught and Y naught, then the value of F1 at X0 should be what? Y0. The value of F2 at um, whatever this point is, let's say X1 and Y1, it has to be the value of F2 at X1 should be Y1. The value of F3 at X2 should be Y2. And the value of F3 at X3 has to be Y3. Okay, you might say, what about F2 at X1? Well, F2 at X1 should also be Y1, but that is already considered here when you did continuity. So I have four equations from curves passing through the points. That's 10. I need two more equations, and these two come from the first and the last point, the boundary conditions. So sometimes you determine the initial and the final slope, like you give the initial slope. Okay, you might call it slope number 1, and this one you might call it uh, slope number n. You might call it S3. These you will fix. Okay, you will determine the initial slope and the final slope, or sometimes you determine the initial and the final curvature. Okay, so for example, you might say, well, F1 double prime at X naught should be the same as F3 double prime at X3, and they should both be zero or non-zero value. Okay, so you determine the curvature at the beginning or at the end. Or you might, as I said, determine the slope at the beginning and at the end. So this is S1 and then F3 prime at X3 is S3. Okay, so, and that's where the uh, natural boundary condition or the clamp boundary condition will come into play. But in general, it's either this one or the bottom one. And that gives you two extra equations, determining the beginning and the end conditions. And that means solving for 12 equations and 12 unknowns. So yes, you just clicked on four points. It passed a nice smooth curve through them. But it means behind the scene, it's solved for a 12 by 12 system of unknowns and equations. So the more you click, it is going to solve more and more for more and more unknowns and has to form more and more equations. Okay, so drawing SP line, it looks so nice and smooth and fancy to you. Behind the scene, it is putting some good pressure on the CAD software. But of course, if your computer is powerful enough, it does not really do any uh, major impact because they are all, all of those computations are very, very small fractions of seconds, milliseconds, microseconds, and so on.
Okay, but again, there is a ton of math. If you want more detail of that, please watch this video I mentioned. And uh, again, my goal here was to tell you that many of the tasks done in a regular CAT software, they are done using geometry and solving equations, okay? Nothing is magical. If we don't know it, we simply say we don't know. Okay, thank you. See you in the next lecture.